All things, the Buddha said, are rooted in desire. This is especially true of your sense of who you are. It's part of a process called becoming, which is the act of taking on an identity in a world of experience. It starts with a desire, and then you cling to the desire. And around the object of the desire, there develops a world in which that object exists. And then there's a sense of you in that world, both as what will enjoy the object when it's obtained, and what has the power and capabilities to obtain it. The self as the consumer, the self as the producer. This is how we function in the world. This is how we were born into the world. At the moment you left your last life, some image related to the human world appeared in the mind, and you went for it. The human world developed around it, and you took on this identity as a person in the world. The canon has a very vivid image of this, very vivid, very vivid image for this. A crow sitting in a human skull. We like to think they were human beings in the last lifetime and just became human again. But who knows what we were? It can be a very incongruous change of identities. But as we live in the human world, we find that it's not just one world and one self. There are many worlds in the human world, many objects of desire within those different worlds. As we go through life, we focus on wanting this, wanting that, and then getting a sense of the different worlds that we would have to inhabit in order to gain those things, and the different kinds of people we would have to become. Sometimes we go for the object, and sometimes we decide it's not worth it. But over time, we develop a whole stable of different selves. the self of your work life, the self of your family life, the self of whatever, whatever other social identities you took on. And in some cases they're skillful, in some cases they're not. But as the Buddha said, all of these states of becoming involve suffering. This is the process we have to overcome. And this is one of the reasons he taught the teaching on not-self, to learn how to strip away, starting with the unskillful senses of self, all the unnecessary members of the, of the stable, to develop a few necessary ones that are going to be useful for the path. And then when the goal is attained, then you can put those selves aside too. But it's important that you realize that you're clearing these things away. It's not just a, an issue of saying, not self, not self, not self, that isn't me. Because each sense of self is embedded in a particular world. And those worlds are based on clinging. And as you remember, clinging comes in four forms. There's sensuality clinging, the sensual pleasures, the sensual fascination that forms a nucleus for your desire. views about the world in which that object is going to be found, habits and practices, the things you have to do, the things you should do within the context of that world, based on how that world is structured, how it works. And then there's the you, the one who can develop those skills. So each you is embedded in quite a lot of other things. And in order to clean out the stables, you have to realize the connections. Some people say, well, just let go of your clinging to self and that'll take care of everything else. But that's not the case. I know people who've had what they said was a great experience of not self in their meditation, but they can go back and they can do really unskillful things. 
And they've learned to justify those unskillful things to themselves. You have to look at all the things you're clinging to, the object that you're clinging to. Is it worth it? For example, suppose you wanted to become an actor, you wanted to get an Oscar. You have to look at the Oscar. Is it really worth it? Have a little statuette on your, on your mantle. But then you think about the world you would have to go into, the world of the movie industry. Is that a world you really want to inhabit? What are the values of the world? And what are the things you would have to do in order to function within that world? And what kind of person would you have to become? We like to think that Oscars are handed on on the basis of merit, but there are a lot of other things that go into them. And so you look at the object of the desire, and you realize that it's really not worth it. You look at the world you would have to inhabit and realize, okay, that's not a world I'd want to inhabit. And you look at the things you'd have to do and the skills you have to develop in order to make your way in that world, and realize that they're not the kind of skills that would be helpful for you in the long term. So you have to attack each self in all these dimensions, and you have to do it again and again. This is one of the reasons why it's so difficult, say, for an old person to move to a new country. The sense of themselves gets really threatened, because the world is a different place. The skills that are needed are different skills. The barriers that are put up for the objects of desire are more insurmountable. This is also how we find, say after we've lived at the monastery for a while, when you go back home, you start picking up your old habits. The self that worked in that world takes over. So you really have to contemplate deeply about what is it in each of those worlds that you find attractive? What do you want to get out of those worlds? Have a strong sense of the kind of actions you will and will not do. And then it can help pry you loose from some unskillful habits, unskillful selves that you developed. Even with the skillful selves, you have to see their drawbacks and the drawbacks of the worlds to which they lead. This is why the Buddha gave that teaching on the graduated discourse. He talks about generosity, virtue. These are all really great skills to develop. He talks about their rewards particularly the rewards that come in heaven, the best place you can be reborn in. But then you realize it's almost like it's a fiendish trick. You work so hard at being good, being generous and virtuous, and getting to a place where you want to go, and then you're going to fall. And when you fall, it hurts very badly. All that work to get those rewards. And even they will let you down. This is why the Buddha said that all states of becoming lead to suffering, or involve suffering. And why when the Buddha recommends that you develop the perception of not-self, he also recommends the perception of no delight in any world. Because the self and the world go together. If you still delight in the world, then no matter how many times you contemplate the drawbacks of the kind of self you've acquired, you're still going to go back and use it. So contemplate both sides. Contemplate all around. Because we cling all around.
But the good news is that we don't have to cling. You learn how to let go selectively. As I said, you clean out the stables, get rid of the unskillful selves first, develop the skillful ones. And when they've taken you as far as they can go, then you take the next step without them. So try to see how deeply embedded your sense of identification is in everything you do. Because after all, every action you have, you have to have the sense that you're going to be able to do it and you're going to benefit from it. In fact, this is why a sense of self lingers on even all the way through the third stage of awakening. Because you've still got work to do. After the first stage, you've finished your work in terms of virtue, but you've still got work to do in terms of concentration and discernment. Because without that sense of your capabilities, without that sense that you're going to benefit, you can't do anything. But to get rid of the unnecessary selves, you have to realize how deeply embedded they are in every sense of the world. And how you have to contemplate all around in order to get past them. But it is possible to get past not only the unskillful ones, but also the skillful ones. There's that moment of non-fashioning, disidentification, where there is no sense of identification at all. There's nothing to move into anything. And instead of leading to nothingness, at least to the highest happiness, a happiness that doesn't need to be maintained, and a happiness that you don't have to do anything to gain any further, and you don't have to do anything to keep it going. And that's when your self-strategies can always be put aside. Because in that attainment, there's no world either. Nothing to be done. No further object to be attained. And so no need for any sense of self. You put that whole cluster of clings aside. 